So you've conducted a survey and you've ended up with a lot of jumbled answers, an abundance of numbers. It's now time to reduce the data into something that you can make sense of as a whole to help answer the question, what does it all mean? And that brings us to the topic of data reduction. Simply put, data reduction involves reducing the raw data of research into a much smaller number of categories to make the research data more comprehensible or understandable. Rather than having a bunch of individual numbers, you can reduce them down to a smaller group of answers, such as 20% of the respondents in our survey said that they studied an average of nine hours a week. This video will briefly discuss descriptive statistics, the key concepts in data reduction, such as our interest in groups rather than individuals, and that we are using a sample to generalize to a larger population, as well as the types of data based upon the number of variables involved in our analysis. And finally, we'll end with a brief overview of the typical statistical tests used to reduce the data to make it more understandable. Let's start with a brief discussion of descriptive statistics. The word descriptive is instructive. We are describing something. Descriptive statistics, then, are used to organize and describe the characteristics of a collection of data, or a set of data. Go back to our survey of college students. We've asked five questions, six if you count recording the student's name, of lots of college students. If you're like me, you're wondering if everyone answered the same way, or differently. Are people clustered all around a particular opinion or answer, or do they hold different opinions? We are interested in how the data vary, and that's what descriptive statistics do. The first step to data reduction is to take all of your survey responses and put them in what is called a data file, sometimes called a data set. Here you will see our six variables across the top. They're in columns, name, hours per week studying, sex, satisfaction level, TV ownership, and age, plus a case number or ID number. Each of the rows consists of the answers or the data for each student. Our first respondent or record is John, who said he studies 10 hours a week, he's male, very satisfied with his grade, owns a television, and is 17 years old. But you're looking at a bunch of numbers and answers. If you want to summarize the data, you could come up with an average number of study hours a week, and that would help describe the data. You could also summarize the percentage of males and females, determine the most frequent satisfaction level, which looks like somewhat satisfied in this data set, as well as the average age. But to do that, to describe the data, you need to reduce these numbers and answers to something more manageable. Hey, that sounds a lot like data reduction. So descriptive statistics, then, allows you to summarize complex data and show how the data vary. But what if you wanted to know if students who study more hours a week are more satisfied with their grades than those who study fewer hours per week? You can use descriptive statistics to determine that, too. And you may be wondering what, if any, relationships exist among variables, perhaps involving multiple variables, such as could the presence of a television in the household when combined with a person's age, be related to the number of hours a week students study? Yep, descriptive statistics can help you determine that, too. To start making sense of the data you have collected, it's important to understand some key points, the first of which I've previously alluded to. We are interested in groups, not individuals. We don't want to know specifically what Hamid, Emily, or Rose said, but what the group of respondents said. Not that Hamid says he studies four hours a week, but that 20% of those we surveyed reported studying an average of nine hours a week. That brings us to the difference between a sample and a population. If we wanted to know the average hours the students at a given university study, we could conduct research to get that information from every student at that university. We want to know what the entire population of students say. However, that would be both costly and unrealistic. There will be some students who will not answer the survey, intentionally or not. So we would likely conduct the survey with a smaller number of students, a sample. Think about what you do when you cook, say, a pot of spaghetti sauce. If you want to know how the sauce tastes, you sample the sauce. You don't eat the entire pot. And as long as your sampling spoon is representative of the entire pot, you can conclude or infer 
that what you have tasted can be generalized to the entire pot. Think of the pot of spaghetti sauce as the population and the sauce you have in your spoon as the sample. You are using the sample to make inferences to a larger group and that's the concept of inferential statistics. Next we need to think about the types of data you will analyze. There are three different types of data, univariate, bivariate, and multivariate. The key to understanding each is the first part of the word as it refers to the number of variables. Uni means one, so when you are looking at data from a single variable, your data is univariate. In our example earlier, if we want to know the average number of hours a week students study, we could calculate that average, say nine hours a week, or we could group the hours into categories. What percentage of students study for fewer than six hours a week? What percentage report studying six to 10 hours per week? And so on. By means two. So bivariate data is when you are comparing the responses between two variables. You are looking for relationships between those variables. In our example, we might wonder if the presence of a television in the home is related to the number of hours a student studies, or if the number of study hours is correlated with grade satisfaction. Multi means, well, multiple. We are comparing responses across three or more variables. We are looking for interactions. Perhaps grade satisfaction is due to a combination of factors, age, presence of a television in the household, a number of hours spent studying. That brings us to the typical statistical tests you would perform with the data, depending upon the type of variables you are analyzing. Another way to look at this is as techniques to accomplish data reduction. Remember that univariate is concerned with a single variable. Depending upon the type of data you are collecting, you could perform frequency analyses. How many times or how frequently did a certain answer show up in the data? If out of 100 cases, 65 students said that they were somewhat satisfied with their grade, then the frequency percentage would be 65%. You can also calculate what are called measures of central tendency, mean, median, and mode, or what are commonly referred to as averages. Mean refers to the arithmetic average. Say, students reported studying an average of nine hours a week. Median is the middlemost score, which might very well be different from the mean, and the mode refers to the score that occurs most frequently. Again, it could be different than the mean or the median, and there may actually be more than one mode. Other statistical tests focus on how the data are dispersed or spread. You're probably already familiar with the range, minimum and maximum values, but three other statistical tests are important here, standard deviation, variance, and z-score, and you'll learn more about these later. Moving to bivariate statistical tests, remembering that now you're interested in the relationship between two different variables. You might conduct cross-tabulation analysis, such as chi-square, to determine if television ownership, for example, is correlated with satisfaction levels. Or, if you're interested in comparing means, say, comparing the number of study hours by sex, or by age, or by satisfaction level, there are a number of statistical tests that can help you do that as well, such as t-tests, ANOVA, or analysis of variance, and correlation analysis. If you are interested in interaction effects among three or more variables, you would conduct multivariate statistical tests, such as multiple regression, factor analysis, or MANOVA, multivariate analysis of variance. Don't worry about knowing what all of these are now. At this point, it's just important for you to know that they exist and that they all exist for a single purpose, to reduce the data to make it more comprehensible, enabling you to draw conclusions or make inferences. Processing time. How does data reduction relate to descriptive statistics? What is the difference between a sample and a population? And what are the three types of variables used for statistical analysis? If you haven't already, you'll soon see the value of reducing a large set of data to a more manageable set of summary statistics. It is only when you can perceive patterns that you can begin to make sense of what you see. Data reduction techniques, then, help you see those patterns so that you'll be able to draw conclusions.